Hello and welcome to my channel. I'm Yunus. In this video, I'll discuss about the basics of Kubernetes. So, if you are already familiar with Kubernetes architecture and Kubernetes basics, you may skip this video because this only contains the basics. In this video, I will discuss about the advantages of containerization of your applications and the need for container orchestration tool and a little bit of history about Kubernetes and then we will get into the high level architecture of Kubernetes which will show the components of the master node and the worker nodes. Okay, let's begin. Okay, let's start with this question, what is Kubernetes? Kubernetes is an open source container orchestration tool. So that is the official definition of Kubernetes. Now let us try to understand more details about this definition itself. First, we will see these two words container and orchestration. So what is a container? If you are trying to learn more about Kubernetes, I'm sure you already know what a container is, but I will try to explain in very, very simple words or very few words what is a container and we will proceed from there because we need to understand what is a container to understand what is container orchestration. So a container is a portable lightweight standalone computing instance. So now let's try to understand each of these adjectives. So it says it is portable. So what does portable, why, what makes it portable? That is because a container includes your application code. I'll write it as app, app code plus all its dependencies. If you need a binary, which is part of the operating system, if you need that binary for your software to work, then what you will do is instead of running your application always on that particular operating system, you will take that binary and combine it with your application and you will create what is called the container image. And once you instantiate that container image, it will already have that particular de dependency or that binary. So your application, your container will work the same way in every platform. So because all dependencies are already included as part of the container image, it works the same way in multiple platforms or multiple OS platforms. It works the same way because the container contains everything which is required to run the application. So this makes it highly portable. So that is one important quality feature. And the next one is lightweight. What makes it lightweight? What makes it lightweight? We know that the container doesn't include the operating system or the operating system kernel is not included as part of the container image that actually reduces compared to a virtual machine image which is like 1 1.5 GB a container image may be 70 MB, 80 MB, so on and so forth. So one reason why it is lightweight is no OS. The second reason is your application. The application which is being packaged as a container image is usually a small application or microservice. So because of these two, it is actually small in size, small size which makes the boot up faster. So faster boot up. So this faster boot up and high portability, these two features or these two properties of a container is actually very desirable for all modern applications, which are all modern applications which are being used by the web scale companies, which are the web scale companies the companies which provide their services through the web such as Google, Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, all these are web scale companies and they are using modern applications which are aligned with the continuous integration, continuous deployment, the DevOps principles. So if you need to follow CICD, continuous integration, continuous deployment, then you need faster boot up because if for deploying your application, or for deploying a small change in your application, if it is going to take two hour process, then the CACD is not going to work. So the web scale companies actually prefers containerized applications 
because they can actually follow the continuous integration, continuous deployment principle and overall management of your applications is simpler. So we were discussing about the container part. Now let us discuss about the orchestration part, why orchestration part is required. You know, we said that many companies prefer the containerized applications, but how many containers are there in an IT landscape? Google says every week they are deploying 2 billion containers in their landscape, 2 billion containers. Okay, that is Google, but that may not be true for all the other companies, but still you actually it gives an idea about the huge number of containers which are launched into the IT landscape of each of the companies. So when you actually launch so many containers, it requires management. So what do you mean by management? What are the various management activities required when you have containers running in your IT landscape? So you need to launch the containers. You need to terminate once it is not required. Then you need monitoring, health monitoring, because you cannot allow them to die on their own. Then you need software upgrades, okay? Millions of containers and you need software upgrades. Just imagine the complexity. Then you need scaling up and down. Then disaster recovery, very important. If a container dies, it has to be replaced immediately. Then ensuring high availability. All these tasks need to be done to orchestrate your container clusters and that is called orchestration of your containers. If you have just two containers or three containers in your IT landscape, you can manually do that. It is something like if you are a shepherd and if you have like four or five goat or sheep, you can manage it yourself, right? But what if, if you have thousands of them, then you will need some level of automation. I don't know whether you can call it automation, but you need some help, right? To manage such big number of sheep. So the containers, you can consider them as kind of sheep. So when your company is small, maybe you have only very few containers, but you're, you decide to containerize most of your applications. So the number of containers increases and finally it fills your IT landscape. And then you are not in a position to manually orchestrate all your containers. How will you orchestrate 2 billion containers? Not possible, right? So that is where you need a tool, automation tool, which can do that task for you. And Kubernetes is the most widely used container orchestration tool. So let's see a little bit of history about that. So Kubernetes automates the deployment, the management, scaling and disaster recovery of containerized applications. This tool Kubernetes was created by Google. Before they created Kubernetes, they had another tool called Borg, which they were using internally for their cluster management and internal container management activities. In 2014, they created a new version and open sourced it and they named it as Kubernetes. That is the history in brief about Kubernetes. Today it is being managed by a forum called CNCF. Now let's see the architecture of Kubernetes. So Kubernetes architecture, it is organized into Kubernetes clusters. In a Kubernetes cluster, there are different type of nodes. Okay, so in a cluster, when there are different type of nodes, obviously one type of node will be the control node, somebody who controls or the master node, who is the brain. And then you will have your worker nodes where the actual containers are running. So containers are not running in master node, but master node will decide where to run the containers, in which worker node it will run and which container need to be replicated, which container need to be upgraded. Everything is decided and controlled from master node, but the actual containers are running in the worker nodes. So if you need to run your containers in a worker node, what do you need? You can already see that here the container runtime or Docker. Here in this case, Docker, that's what we are actually going to use, even though there, other, there can be other container runtimes, but we are talking about Docker because that is the most widely used container runtime today. So you have the container runtime in this worker node and on top of that, you can create the containers. But when you create the containers, you can't create the containers directly. So container runtime runs the containers and the container runtime runs the containers and it can pull the container images from a registry 
such as Docker Hub or ECR, etc. It can start and stop containers and it can manage the container resources. But the instruction should come from the head office, right? Who is the head office? The master node. On top of the container, you can run your containers, but you have to run the containers inside what is called pod. Pods are the smallest deployable units in Kubernetes. And they are the basic building blocks of Kubernetes applications. I will do a separate video on pods. These pods actually provide shared storage and networking for the containers inside them. Usually, one pod will contain one container for a microservice. But then in some cases, the main container may need a helper container, such as if this is a web container, there may be a cache container, which need to be running in the same host and which need to communicate continuously with the main container, master container, etc. In such cases, you can actually have both the containers running in the same pod. Usually one pod corresponds to one microservice. When you are replicating the containers, you will actually replicate the entire pod, not the individual containers. And the pods are actually created and managed by the Kubernetes control plane or the master node. We will come to that. If if this is a web container and if you need to scale it out, actually you have to scale out the entire pod one so that both the helper container as well as the master container will be replicated. Actually the concept of pod in Kubernetes makes it easy to tag multiple containers that are treated as a single unit of deployment. They are co-located on the same host and share the same resources such as network, memory and storage. And each pod actually gets a dedicated IP address that is shared by all the containers belonging to it. This word pod actually in real life in nature also you will see pod and the pod say in, in, in the context of vegetables this is actually a pod which is a container uh, which contains the seeds inside it and this is actually known as a pod. So similar to that here also you can see that each pod actually contains multiple containers just like this pod in the nature contains multiple seeds here it is multiple containers so now who creates these containers who controls the creation termination replication of these ports that is done from master node so let us see some of the components in the master node and the first component in master node you can see it is api server which is the entry point into the master node basically the api server is the interface with, with the rest of the cluster the api server interfaces with other components inside the master node as well as it interfaces with the components in the worker nodes it provides a restful api then we have scheduler scheduler is the one which decides when you are launching a new container or when you are launching a new pod in which worker node it should be created that is decided by scheduler based on the available resources in the nodes maybe th this node resources are full so it will actually create in the next one or in the next one so scheduler is the one which decides and once the ports are created it needs to be recorded somewhere so that the cluster knows that okay how many ports are running how many containers are running etc so it needs a database so we have a key value store which is called it cd it cd is a key value store which stores the cluster state it is used to store and retrieve information about the cluster so it cd has the current state the desired state of all the worker nodes all the ports etc when you are scaling up when a pod need to be replicated when you're scaling up you need to you need to replicate a pod so who controls such activities we have several controllers and there is a controller manager as well and the controllers include say for example replication controller deployment controller etc is the replication controller which actually ensures that the ports are replicated according to the configurations provided and all these components actually communicate with api server and if they want to scheduler wants to create a new container in this uh, worker node then the instructions actually go through the api server to there is another component in this worker node which is called kubelet kubelet is required in every worker node and that actually receives the instructions from the master node so kubelet receives it and then kubelet actually creates the required ports based on the instructions received from the master node or the head office you can say 
cubelet communicates with the control plane it gets instructions from the control plane or it gets instructions from the master node about which ports to run on which node etc and ensures that the desired states of ports is maintained then we have one more important component which is called the cube proxy cube proxy is a network proxy that runs on each worker node it is responsible for routing traffic to the correct ports for example as part of your application process maybe this port port 1 need to communicate with port 2 and port 2 may have multiple replicas as part of the scale up maybe port 2 there are five different replicas which is running so when port 1 is trying to communicate with port 2 it will be routed through cube cube proxy cube proxy will decide cube proxy can also do a level of load balancing so it will decide to which replica of port 2 that particular message should be routed so cube proxy actually acts as the router plus the load balancing activity also it can do it ensures that the traffic is distributed evenly across the ports okay so this was about the basics of kubernetes why kubernetes is required and the high level architecture of kubernetes i will continue the series and i will cover other kubernetes topics as well in the upcoming videos i hope you enjoyed this video please let me know your comments in the comment section i'll keep coming back with more useful videos please consider subscribing to my channel thank you bye